After acetylcholine has bound to its receptor on the motor end plate, there has to be a mechanism in order to cause the acetylcholine to stop binding. Otherwise, the person would have continuous muscle contractions. So the way that the body prevents this is it utilizes a special enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And this is a very important enzyme that is going to block acetylcholine from binding. So what it's going to do is it's going to break acetylcholine down into its two components to the acetyl part plus the choline part. This is what I like to think of as the body's own recycling system. So if we take a look here at the neuromuscular junction, the junction between the axon terminal and the motor end plate, which is the region of the sarcolemma where we have acetylcholine receptors. In this area, acetylcholine will be released. After it binds, it needs to be broken down into its two units by this enzyme, which we call ACHase, acetylcholine esterase. Once it's broken down into its two component parts, then each individual part can be recycled and returned into the axon terminal for the next muscle contraction so that it can be used again. So this is a very important part and when there's trouble with the acetylcholine receptor um, certain diseases can arise. In your textbook in homeostatic imbalance 9.1 you have a homeostatic imbalance that is listed called myasthenia gravis. And in myasthenia gravis this is a disease that is going to be characteristic of weak muscle muscles. Um, so oftentimes patients will exhibit drooping upper eyelids, difficulty swallowing, difficulty talking, generalized muscle weakness. And oftentimes this is first going to affect the smaller muscles. When it affects the smaller muscles, um, eventually it will affect some larger muscles. But the problem that causes this disease is, is that it's an autoimmune disorder, and it's an autoimmune disorder that is caused by antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. So the acetylcholine receptor is going to be attacked by antibodies. And these antibodies essentially are going to block the acetylcholine receptor so that the common treatment for this disease is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So if the enzyme that blocks the breakdown of acetylcholine to its two component parts is present, then acetylcholine will be present longer in the synaptic cleft. It can bind to the motor end plate and we can have m stronger muscle contractions. This slide is showing the generation of the action potential which now is going to occur at the sarcolemma. You're going to learn more about the action potential when you get to chapter 11, but for now it's important to realize that the sarcolemma is polarized. And the word polarized means that there is a potential difference in electrical charge between the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid. And this potential difference means that uh, there is a um, charge difference between the inside or one end of the membrane and the other end of the membrane much like a battery. A battery has a positive end and a negative end. So now when an action potential occurs, it occurs because of the important ion sodium and potassium, which you learned about back in chapter, chapter 2, as far as what the importance of those ions are. So the first thing that happens is that there is binding of acetylcholine molecules to the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. And when it binds, what we see are chemically ligand channels. And a ligand is a special chemical that is going to bind to a receptor, sort of like a key would unlock a lock. So the chemical or the ligand acts as the key to unlock something, and in this case it unlocks a a specialized pump. 
And this specialized pump or ion channel is a gated ion channel that now is going to allow for sodium to enter the cell, as we see right here in the sarcolemma. And then potassium is going to exit the cell. When this occurs, there is a change in potential called depolarization, local depolarization. And an action potential can now continue down the sarcolemma to until it eventually reaches the interior region of the muscle. After the sodium goes in, then potassium goes out in each phase, and this leads to a repolarization, which is number three in your textbook. So it's kind of the opposite of the depolarization phase. So this is an enlargement showing the repolarization phase, which is, again, because of the potassium going out. We call this potassium efflux. And this is marked by a graph, which is indicated here. And this graph is slightly different than what you have in your textbook. Uh, your textbook has between negative has negative 95 listed and negative 70 to negative 90 is really the correct range that happens in our plasma membranes this is really a range that occurs so any one muscle fiber mem any any sarcolemma could be between negative 70 and negative 80 a nerve membrane could be a little more negative negative 90 or negative 95 so whether you know this number is negative 80, negative 70, negative 90 is not important. The important thing is that you know that it is very negative. And this is a specialized recording of the electrical charge of the intracellular fluid of the cell. So if you recall back to chapter 3, you learned that the extracellular fluid has much more sodium than potassium. There's potassium that's on the intracellular fluid. And so we have a, a variation of cations and anions that are on the outside. Because of this difference of sodium and potassium, the inside is going to be more negative compared to the outside. And that magical number is usually going to be about negative 70 millivolts, or it could be more than this, negative 80, but it's more negative than the outside. So the outside would be zero compared to the inside. So this graph is really showing a comparison between the inside and the outside. So when depolarization occurs, sodium is going to enter the cell, and that's going to cause this number of negative 70 to become more positive or less negative. And that's what we see by this upswing in this chart, which is depolarization. Now, another important number that you need to know is negative 55 millivolts. This is always going to be negative 55 millivolts and negative 55 millivolts is the threshold number and it's going to be the number at which the sodium gates are going to open so if enough sodium is going to enter into the cell then there's going to be an action potential that actually is going to occur and when this occurs you can see that the graph automatically goes up to plus 30. So the plus 30 right here is the point where there is a reversal of the polarity. So now potassium channels are going to open, the sodium channels close, and potassium starts to rush back out of the cell. So we have repolarization that is going to occur here. So at this point, these are the main parts of the action potential you need to know. You'll learn more about it when you get to chapter 11. So we have now covered the neuromuscular junction. Remember, the neuromuscular junction is an important video that you need to watch on A&P Flicks, which is found in your study area under Mastering A&P. So hopefully you have already watched this. The second video that you need to watch, so you may want to pause this lecture and go back and watch this before we go through this, is called Excitation Contraction Coupling. And also in Mastering A&P there is a great uh, resource called Interactive Physiology. And in Interactive Physiology it's going to take you step by step through a lot of these same processes as well. So this is a, a complicated process so it's difficult. 
it's difficult and you need to uh, go through it um, on from multiple videos to look at it um, and then the third video that you're going to watch in the A&P Flex is called the cross bridge cycle and this is where the actual bridges are going to form between the myosin and the actin. So let's take a, a quick look at this figure that you have in your textbook as well and this video is sort of setting the stage for the excitation and the contraction coupling. So now acetylcholine has bound to its receptor proteins on the sarcolemma and it's triggered another action potential which is what we saw on the previous diagram showing the graph of what happens with sodium and potassium. You want to make sure that you look at the focus figure which is uh, figure 9.11 in your textbook. So um, when excitation contraction coupling is now going to occur we can see that this action potential which began on the sarcolemma is going to start to continue down the sarcolemma and eventually into these T tubules. And it's in the T tubules where there's going to be a communication between the excited sarcolemma and also the inside of the cell itself, the inside of the muscle cell. So this is where the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to communicate with the sarcoplasm. So this action potential is going to propagate along the sarcolemma and down the T-tubules. The T-tubules are also called transverse tubules, so that, that terminology means exactly the same thing. Once this signal reaches this specialized area, then there is going to be the release of calcium ions from where they are stored. And they are going to be stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So again, there's a lot of various terminology in this chapter. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is a storage area for the calcium. And the regions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which are actually going to touch the T-tubules, are shown right here in this highlighted area. So once the action potential reaches this area, then there is the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into this area here, which is called the, sarco, the sarcoplasm. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is different than the sarcoplasm. The sarcoplasm, it, remember it sounds just like cytoplasm, and it essentially is the cytoplasm of the muscle. So once there is now going to be calcium found in the sarcoplasm, calcium can now interact with the troponin. Once it interacts with troponin, it could then cause these binding sites, which we see here, to be revealed. So really helpful way to, to, for you to remember the activities that happen now within the sarcoplasm is if you think about calcium as a major player and also as ATP as a major player. Calcium is going to interact with troponin and ATP is going to interact with myosin. Once these two interactions occur, then eventually the cross bridge can form. And again, you have an A&P Flix video on cross bridging you need to watch. And there's another focus figure which is very helpful to also show you the cross bridging cycle. First of all, when the cross bridge attachment forms, this occurs because the myosin actually attaches to the actin. And remember that actin is the thin filament and the myosin is the thick filament. So it's called a cycle because there's this repetitive use, repetitive uh, sequence of events that are going to occur. The first event that occurs in the cross bridge cycle is remember after excitation, this is after excitation contraction coupling has occurred. So calcium is now present in the sarcoplasm and it's now going to bind to the troponin and the troponin tropomyosin is going to move out of the way 
to uncover the binding site. So now the first event that happens here for the cross bridge formation is the myosin is going to break down the ATP. And myosin actually acts like an enzyme. So we refer to myosin really for all intents and purposes as an ATPase. It is going to convert ATP into ADP and an inorganic phosphate. When this happens, now the myosin can actually attach to the actin. So we need one ATP that is required for the cross bridge formation. We now have the power stroke that can occur. The power stroke is also called the working stroke. And the power stroke is when the myosin causes the actin to slide. So it causes the actin to slide, and actin is going to move towards the age zone to actually shorten the muscle. After the power stroke has occurred, then the myosin is going to detach, and that's what we see in step three. And notice another ATP is required for this. So in order for one cross bridge cycle to occur, we actually need two ATPs to occur, or two ATPs for this process. So this is ATP hydrolysis. Remember, hydrolysis is the use of water to break a bond. Now, in order for one muscle to actually shorten, or one sarcomere to actually shorten, we need 30 to 35 of these cycles to occur. And keep in mind, this is only for one thick filament. So on the, the much larger scale of thousands of sarcomeres to shorten, there has to be many, many of these cross bridges that happen. A good example of uh, when ATP is not present is in the case of rigor mortis. And rigor mortis is going to occur after death. There is stiffening of muscles that occurs. And this is because there is no ATP to detach the myosin heads. So at the point of death, all the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. So there would be lots and lots of cross bridges that form. But since there is no ATP necessary or available for detachment, the muscle stays in a state of rigor. And this does not stop until the muscle proteins eventually are going to degrade. Our next slide is showing the periods of excitation contraction coupling. And these periods are shown in the latent period, or I'm sorry, are shown in the phases of the muscle twitch. The first phase is called the latent period. And these periods are shown in an interactive physiology module. You should go back and watch all of the various modules that are available for muscles. And it's the one that has to do with whole muscle contraction. And this will describe the events as well of excitation muscle contraction that occur in the muscle twitch. So you should know what happens in the latent period, what happens in the contraction period, and what is going to happen in the relaxation period. So let's look at a graph that shows the actual muscle twitch. And this is showing your muscle twitch. It is a recording of a myogram. And in this myogram, we see the latent period, the first period, the contraction period, and the relaxation period. During the latent period, this is when calcium is going to be leaving the sarcoplasmic reticulum and flooding out into the sarcoplasm. So it's the period when calcium becomes available. And so if you know what the sarcoplasmic reticulum is and what the sarcoplasm is, you should be able to understand that this is when, where calcium would be when it starts to become available. So it actually moves into the sarcoplasm. Now that it's in the sarcoplasm, it can start to bind to troponin. And when it binds to troponin, it uncovers the binding site. So now that cross bridges can begin to form. And the cross bridges are going to form during the period of contraction. 
then the period of relaxation is when the calcium is going to return to storage. So I like this graph a lot because it shows, it, it helps to really describe the events that are occurring during a muscle twitch. So if we go back a couple slides to the latent period, you can see during the latent period, this is the time period when events are going to occur at the triad. The action potential is continuing down the sarcolemma. So if we have our sarcolemma, it folds inward to form the T-tubules, the point at which there are two terminal cisterns and one T-tubule. This point is referred to as the triad. So there would be one sarcoplasmic reticulum here and the end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the terminal cistern and then we have our T-tubule. So the area in red is the triad. At this point there is specialized receptors called DHP receptors and then there are other receptors called reanidine receptors. These are just kind of for your information. I had to add them because I had a buddy back in graduate school who was working on a research project for reanidine receptors and DHP receptors, which I thought was quite interesting. So I had to add that, but these are extra things. These would be specialized receptors that are going to allow communication between the terminal cistern and the transverse tubule. So now calcium is going to be released from the terminal cistern, and the calcium is actually going to be going into the sarcoplasm. So we see the calcium going from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. Now it can bind with troponin. And the troponin C is just the portion of the troponin that actually binds to it. So now the troponin tropomyosin complex swivels and moves out of the way to expose the binding site for myosin. This slide is showing the cross-bridging formation. And again, remember that this is actually going to be occurring during the contraction phase of the muscle twitch. And then during the relaxation phase of the muscle twitch, this is when the calcium is going to be store returning back into storage. So it would be these last couple bullets that you see on your slide here. So the myosin cross-bridges are alternating between attachment and contraction. So remember that one cycle is going to require the use of two ATPs as this happens. And you can see this really well in the video is that the actin is going to start to slide towards the center of the sarcomere. It actually slides towards the H zone. Then after during relaxation, calcium moves back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The troponin, tropomyosin blockage is restored, and the muscle fiber relaxes. There's an interesting clinical application here, which uh, will help a lot of you that are already working in a hospital. A, the, the troponin is the same chemical that they test in cardiac patients. So in order to see if there has been heart damage, they test for troponin levels. If the cardiac cell has been damaged, then the troponin will be released from the cell into the extracellular fluid. And that's an indication of possible damage. This is the sequence of events that shows excitation contraction coupling. So remember that after the acetylcholine has bound, would, after it binds, to its receptor, there's then going to be the formation of an action potential that occurs. So the action potential enters the transverse tubule, the T-tubule. Then there's the events that happen at the triad. So this is involving the specialized receptors, which you don't have to know. Again, extra, it's extra to know. But now the calcium channels of the terminal cistern are going to open and the calcium leaves 
from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. It's almost like the calcium is raining down into the sarcoplasm. So now there is a lot of calcium that can bind to the troponin. And it's not important that you know it binds to the troponin C part of the troponin molecule. But what happens is that now troponin tropomyosin are pulled off of the myosin binding site on actin. So there is a actin molecule here. And now the actin molecule has a binding site which is now uncovered. And now the myosin can actually attach to that specific binding site to form the cross bridge. So it's a part of the actin molecule which has a binding site for myosin. So the myosin heads now bind to the active sites of actin to form the cross bridge. The myosin bridge pivots and pulls the actin inward. This is called the power stroke, also called the working stroke. And then a new molecule of AT binds to the myosin and allows for detachment. Then the relaxation phase occurs where the calcium is going to return from the sarcoplasm into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This slide is showing what is called a motor unit. And a motor unit is a very important term for you to know. A motor unit is defined as one motor neuron so a motor neuron is a specialized neuron that innervates a muscle and it consists of that one motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it controls. So all of the muscle fibers innervated. And you may have looked at this slide in lab. If so, you saw a picture that looks much like letter B in your current slide. And in this case, you'll see axon terminals where the acetylcholine would be released from. And within these axon terminals are where acetylcholine is stored in the synaptic vesicles. So in this slide, we actually see two different motor units. Motor unit number one has one motor neuron But the difference is the amount of fibers that it controls. So if we look closely at motor unit one, for starters, we can see that there is a motor neuron that is coming out of the spinal cord, and it is traveling to a muscle. It controls one muscle fiber here, plus it also controls another muscle fiber. So motor unit one would be described as having one motor neuron plus two fibers that it controls. Whereas motor unit three, or motor unit two rather, is going to control three fibers. And so let's take a closer look at motor unit two. As we trace it out as it comes out of the spinal cord, it controls one muscle fiber here. It also controls another muscle fiber plus a third muscle fiber. So while there's not a big difference in the amount of muscle fibers that it actually controls, motor unit two is going to be a more coarsely controlled muscle than motor unit one. Motor unit one would have a slight more fine control. And the, the reason this is important is a good example is if you think about a cable. If a cable goes into a house and it controls just one TV, Whereas it go, if it goes into a house and controls 10 TVs, we would expect that the signal would be much better for the cable that only has to go to one TV. It's the same thing with these motor neurons. If they have to go to, if that motor neuron has to go to many muscle fibers, that muscle is going to be much more coarsely controlled. So a good example of this would be a muscle called the orbicularis oris, which is our kissing muscle. We use it to open and close our mouth. It's very finely controlled. 
and that is much more finely controlled than a muscle we would refer to as the gluteus maximus. So if you want to test this, you could take a, um, a bottle and touch it to your gluteus maximus and see if your gluteus maximus can, um, is as sensitive then as your orbicularis oris muscle, for example. But you probably already know that without actually doing that test. So our next section here is on graded muscle responses. And a graded muscle response is a varying degree, a variation in degree of that muscle contraction. So we know that skeletal muscles now are voluntarily controlled, consciously controlled, so we can choose to control them. And we can choose to either maximally contract a muscle or weakly contract a muscle as well. As you'll see in one of the interactive physiology videos, the same muscles that are used to pick up a potato chip are used to pick up a six pack of soda. And this, is a, this occurs because of these degrees of muscle responses. And these muscle responses are graded, there's varying levels of them, and they are graded by the frequency of the stimulation. And the frequency of the stimulation would occur by how fast the action potentials reach the axon terminal. So it varies by the degree of excitation. It also can change by the strength of the stimulus that we're actually um, going to be lifting. And we could, there could be a maximal stimulus or a minimal stimulus. So in this slide, we can see a comparison of various muscles. We can see the use of the extraocular muscles like the lateral muscles this is the muscle that we use to um, turn our eye laterally. So a very small muscle that you're going to learn when you get to chapter 15. The gastrocnemius muscle is also going to be shown here. And your gastrocnemius muscle is a, ch is a muscle you're going to have to know in uh, chapter, chapter 10 when you get to it. And then the soleus muscle is a muscle that is deep to the gastrocnemius muscle. So both of them have similar functions. They're used for plantar flexion. So in this case, the calf muscles are going to contract more slowly than the lateral rectus muscles and remained remain contracted for a longer period of time, as you can see from this graph. And these differences are going to occur because they reflect the enzymes, the myosin. And the myosin is the enzyme. Remember, it behaves as an ATP ACE. And also the varying metabolic properties of the individual myofibrils, so how much ATP is going to be available, for example. This is one of the, the reasons for differences in muscle twitches. So the extraocular muscles are going to be very quick muscles. So this is obviously very important if you need to look really quickly to your periphery to see if somebody is pulling out in front of you as you're driving. And your gastrocnemius muscle is going to be a slower muscle that allows you to contract your um, calf for a longer period of time. These slides are showing the muscle twitches in response to varying stimuli. And a muscle twitch, um, the first graph that we saw back here is one that would be produced in a laboratory. But this is not the way our muscles are normally going to operate. In normal healthy muscles, these muscle twitches are going to be additive. And so we'll see a graded muscle response. And they can change in frequency. So for letter A, we're going to be looking at the single stimulus, which we saw in the previous slide, just a smaller view of it. 
And in letter B, we're going to be looking at what's called an incomplete or an unfused tetanus. And in this case, if the stimulus strength is held constant and the muscle is stimulated at, increase, at an increasingly faster rate, the relaxation time between the twitches becomes shorter and shorter. And this would be the time that you can see here, shown with the red arrow. The time frame is shorter and shorter. And during these time periods, the calcium levels in the sarcoplasm or the cytosol of the muscle itself increases. So the degree of the wave summation, and the word wave summation means that these twitches are going to be have an additive effect. So that the second the sequential stimulus is going to be added to the previous one. At higher levels of frequency, so higher stimulations, we're going to see what are called what's called the fused tetanus. And during the fused tetanus, the muscle tension increases until it reaches maximal stimulation. And there is a sustained contraction plateau called the fused tetanus. And this is not the same thing as having the bacterial disease called tetanus that causes involuntary muscle contractions. So in this case, this is a healthy muscle stimulation that we have, and it occurs because of a high frequency of stimulation. So in reality, what is going to happen in our body is that there's going to be a muscle, muscle twitches that happen sequentially, and they will continue to occur to the point where there is summation of all of those twitches. So what we actually end up seeing is a smooth muscle contraction, not a herky-jerky muscle contraction. So the complete tetanus is what really we should be seeing in a healthy muscle. Now if you have some weak muscle contractions or weak involuntary contractions, a lot of times that's due to things like fatigue. So don't freak out and think that you have some sort of neuromuscular disease if you have a weak um, or an incomplete or involuntary contraction. But it's always good to see your doctor about those things. So letter B is abnormal and incomplete tetanus. And what normally happens in our muscle is the smooth tetanic muscle contractions which is what is shown in letter C. So smooth muscle tetanic contractions. So now as the more and more of these motor units are going to be contracted, so again you can you can use the same muscles to pick up a potato chip or to pick a pick up a six pack of soda, the motor, the, what happens is that more and more motor units are going to be recruited. And the idea of recruitment is really exactly what it sounds like. Recruitment is going to be the idea where the nervous system will be stimulating multiple motor units. Kind of a simplistic way to think about this is if we had a muscle that only had, let's say it had um, five motor units. And of these five motor units, and this is not realistic because there's billions of motor units that would be in one single muscle, but if there's a muscle that would only have five, if we wanted to minimally recruit it, there would be a motor unit that would stimulate only two of the motor units. But if we wanted to maximally recruit it, we would recruit all five associated motor units. But after you would maximally re recruit a muscle, then that muscle is quickly going to be fatigued. So that would be one of the problems with maximal recruitment, maximal stimulus. All motor units would be working. What happens in our body, especially for muscles that are used to um, maintain muscle tone, there is going to be an alteration of recruitment. Some motor units would be recruited first, 
and then those motor units would be able to relax and then when those motor units are able to relax then there are going to be other motor units then that are recruited and this motor unit recruitment alternates and that is going to allow for muscle tone so some of the major muscles that we use to maintain muscle tone are going to work in this manner this slide is showing the stimul stimulation to the nerve and you can see in number one that there is basically no motor units that are being recruited in the third in number three there are two motor units that are being recruited so there is still, still minimal recruitment but there's enough of a recruitment that we actually see a an actual physiological response in the muscle and then as more and more motor units are continued to be activated we can see an increase here looks like there is five motor units recruited in number four uh, we see more that are are recruited in number five six seven so at this point we have maximal contraction because there is maximal motor unit recruitment this slide is showing the relationship between motor unit one motor unit two and motor unit three so it's all showing skeletal muscle fibers but there is more tension that is going to be developed in motor unit three because there are larger fibers in this case that would be the difference between muscles like the gluteus maximus muscle or really large postural muscles that we have uh, this would also include large muscles like the quads or the hamstrings group and then the the smaller motor unit one would be the more finely controlled muscles things like the fingertips the finger muscles this slide is showing the difference between isotonic contraction and um, on the next slide we'll see what are called isometric contraction but isotonic contraction is the most common type of muscle that we think of because in this case there is going to be actual sliding of the filaments that occur so you can see that the length of the muscle is actually actually going to adjust so this case it means that these contractions are actually going to move a load so these would be things like flexion and extension remember some of the muscles that are the names of movements that you learned about in chapter 8 the two types of contractions would either be concentric and eccentric and in concentric isotonic contractions the length is actually going to be shortening so the sarcomere is actually going to shorten in this case whereas an eccentric contraction would be just the opposite of this so in an eccentric contraction the sarcomere is actually going to be lengthening so isotonic concentric the sarcomere contracts the muscle shortens and this would be if the biceps brocci would flex isotonic eccentric would be occurring if the opposite occurs so if the triceps brocci lengthens this would be an example of an eccentric contraction another example would be when the tibialis anterior dorsiflexes the foot there would be lengthening of of the muscle the quadriceps when we do a knee bend when this occurs the knee flexing would be an eccentric contraction muscle but at the point where we hold the muscle that's an isometric contraction which we'll talk about next 
but then when the knee extends, that would be a concentric muscle. So it depends on the muscle and exactly what is going to be occurring, whether it would be shortening or whether it would be lengthening. So our next slide is showing isometric concentric or isometric contractions. In an isometric contraction, you can see that there is actually no lengthening. It neither shortens nor does it lengthen. These would be the type of contractions that are going to occur when cross bridges form, but the power stroke does not occur. I like to think of this as the myosin head actually spinning its wheels. It's going to it's going to attach to the actin, but it's not going to be able to actually cause sliding of the filaments. So the myosin attaches to the actin, but doesn't cause sliding. So what happens is the myosin is going to attach to the actin, but then it's going to detach. And it will try over and over again to attach and detach. So it's sort of like it's spinning its wheels, but it's not going anywhere. The next slide is on muscle, twi or muscle tone. And I mentioned muscle tone earlier. Muscle tone is the alternating contraction and relaxation of muscles. And the reason that this is going to occur is because of spinal reflexes. These spinal reflexes a lot of times are going to count for muscle tone and one motor unit will be activated and then another motor unit will be activated. So again, go back to the diagram here. This shows muscle tone. So let's say number one, three, and five, these motor units are going to be activated. Then they're going to relax. And when they're relaxing, two and four are going to be activated. And the, the process is going to repeat itself so that none of the muscle is going to become fatigued. These are the important muscles that are going to be used to help you to stand straight up for a long period of time, even to be able to sit in your chair. A lot of your muscles like your latissimus dorsi and your gluteus muscles, your large postural muscles are going to be required for muscle tone. So these spinal reflexes are going to respond to activation of stretch receptors and muscles and tendons. So this is one of those automatic negative feedback systems that are important for muscle tone to be maintained. Our next slide is a review then of what isometric contractions are and what isotonic contractions are. So remember that isotonic contractions are when there is either shortening or lengthening. So there are isotonic concentric contractions there are also isotonic eccentric contractions that occur. So an example of this would be that when we, can, when we flex our elbow, so for elbow flexion, the biceps brocci is going to be undergoing an isotonic concentric contractions. It's, it would be shortening at the same time the triceps brocci, the antagonistic muscle, is going to be lengthening. So it will be undergoing a isotonic eccentric contraction. However, if we're going to hold our arm in one place, if there's no net shortening or lengthening that is occurring, that would be called an isometric contraction. So iso means equal, and metric means length. So there is equal length that would be occurring within that muscle. 